Hi there. This is Kate Donovan from Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens, and we are going to discuss sustainable gardening, one of my uh, favorite topics of our series. So let me share my screen with you. Okay. So this is my contact information. If you have any questions about gardening in general or about this sustainable gardening presentation, please drop me a line. My name again is Kate Donovan. My email is bvveggiegardens at gmail.com. If you go to my website, there's also a form that you can fill out and that will send you right to the, um, it will send you right to my uh, email box. So there's a form you can fill out. So, okay, so sustainable gardening. Okay, what is sustainability? Sustainability, this is what Webster tells me. The ability to be maintained at a certain rate or level. Also, avoidance of depletion of natural resources in order to maintain an ecological balance, both good definitions. I'm going to add something to it though. Doing more with less. How to stretch your resources. How to save money and save time and be efficient as well as effective. Within this presentation, we're going to talk a lot about the gifts that keep on giving. We're going to talk about growing perennial food, perennial food crops. We're going to talk about preserving your food, because you know it all comes out at once, right? Um, lengthening your growing season, saving money, and then we'll have a Q&A period. Okay, so perennials. One of the crops that we have that keeps on giving year after year after year, huge harvest, great bang for the buck, are your fruit trees. Peach trees, pear trees, apple trees, cherry trees, plum trees, and a number of others that grow. You want to put fruit trees in? Please make sure you're doing it right. I've had my apple trees for about, I bought them when they were twigs, nothing but twigs. And I finally got my first apple. Takes about seven years to get a good, uh, good bearing of apple, apples. Other fruits, it takes less time. But apples and pears uh, take quite a, bit of, quite a few years if you buy the plants small. So what are you going to, what do you, what do you consider the considerations before you invest in uh, uh, fruit trees? Okay, let's, let's talk about the climate. You want one that grows in your zone here in Southern New England. In, uh, I, uh, we are on the Massachusetts, Rhode Island border. This is zone six here. You certainly don't want to grow, uh, try to grow bananas or guava, or papaya, lemon or orange, while well, you can grow them inside, but for the most part, you know what I mean. You have to grow something that, that loves it here. Also, the size of the fruit, the size of the tree matters. So do you want a full-size tree, a dwarf tree, semi-dwarf tree? I say this for a reason. A pear tree can grow 30 feet tall. How am I possibly going to harvest from a 30 foot tall tree? I mean, how are you going to do that in your backyard? First of all, you're casting shade. You may not have the area to cast shade like that without disrupting some of the other crops you're growing. So what I opted to do is I opted for uh, dwarf trees. My dwarf trees are 10 feet tall at the most. And I can space them 10 feet from one another 
as opposed to 30 feet for a full uh, size tree. They also have the semi dwarf, they're, they're about a 20 feet tall. And uh, the height of the, take the height of the tree at, at, full, uh, at full size, and that is how far you're supposed to space your trees from one another. Also, the majority of the fruit trees that I speak of when I talk about apples, peaches, uh, pear trees, uh, uh, cherry trees, most of them, if they're not, if they're not self-pollinating, they still produce better if they are grown with another similar cultivar that blooms at the same time of a different variety. For example, uh, let's take your uh, apples, for example. If you grow a Macintosh, and you grow another Macintosh, you think they'll cross-pollinate, they won't. You grow a Macintosh and you grow a Fuji or some other plant, some other tree that, that, that bears, uh, that pollinates at the flowers at the same time. This is all stuff that you research before you, you purchase. Most apple trees, most pear trees are uh, cross-pollinating and you, and you need another cultivar similar cultivar to get the best yield. Other trees like peach trees are not self, I mean, are self-pollinating. However, they still do better and bear more fruit if they are grown with another species in close proximity. Okay. Um, crops that keep on keeping on. Now let's talk a little bit about fruit bushes. Okay, so I, I picked the three common ones. These crops, especially the raspberries and the blackberries are so common that you see them in people's backyard and they don't even know they're blackberries and raspberries. Because number one, they grow wild. They keep popping up, they, they keep popping up like whack-a-moles up through the ground, but if they're not fed and if they're not in the right amount of sun, they will not bear fruit. So people don't even know that they're blackberries and raspberries. So in blueberries also, you do see some wild blueberry bushes now and again, more to the north of us, more in places such as, um, more, the blueberries are more, um, yeah, it, I see a lot of those in the uh, up north in Maine, et cetera, places like that, that they grow wild. So let's talk about, uh, let's see here. Let's talk about, oh, oh, let's talk a little bit more about these fruit bushes, okay. Blackberries and raspberries are from the same basic family. Believe it or not, they're in the same family as the roses, uh, which, kind of will uh, explain why they have those nasty thorns sticking out of them. Now, blackberries come in black. That's the color of the fruit. If you lift, if you turn over the leaf of a blackberry, the underside will be green, just the same color as the top side of the leaf. Raspberries come in three different colors, yellow, golden, I should say. I'll say golden, red, and black. If you lift up or turn over and look at the underside of a raspberry, the color will be light blue. So that's the indication that you have a, a raspberry as opposed to a blackberry. I like raspberries better. They're a little sweeter. Raspberry thorns are a little bit smaller. They don't grow quite as big. You know, I have some blackberry canes where they'll grow 10, sort of 10 feet in the air. Also with the raspberries, you have some that bear once in the summer and some that bear slowly all through the summer. They're called ever bearing. They'll, they'll bear fruit on the top canes and then uh, in the fall, they'll bear fruit on the, on, the, on the bottom of the canes. 
So, and, and they're, they're, they're great. I, I, as I say, I find the, uh, the raspberries easier. But once you plant the raspberries or the blackberries, they, they tunnel underground and then just pop up wherever they choose. So you have a lot of extra. You can trade those. You can, you can re-harvest them and, and put them in a place where you know it's going to be sunny. You can put some peat moss, peat moss, Canadian sphagnum peat moss is an uh, acidifying amendment. It's a soil amendment. Um, so a par good part of your compost, but um, it will actually bring the pH down as they like it uh, a little bit on the acidic side. Blueberries like it very much on the acidic side. So, um, you know, you, when you invest in these, in these crops, as I say, they, they need full sun, um, they need to be fed, they need to be pruned as well. And how you prune them depends on whether they're ever bearing or whether they're uh, summer bearing. And you should do a little bit of research before you, before you do that, or you may inadvertently cut off the next year's fruit supply, which you don't, certainly don't want to do. So that's a little bit about your, your food bushes. So perennial maintenance, this is for trees and for bushes. They, you, you, you can, you can um, there's three things you have to do to them, right? You have to feed them, and uh, you know these these trees have a different type of nutrition, nutritional needs. You obviously don't feed something that creates a hundred, you know, uh, to three hundred berries from one plant. You don't feed it the same way you'd feed an herb that doesn't have to do a whole heck of a lot except smell nice, right? So that you do have special fertilizers uh, uh, that you can use. Um, every once in a while, you know, the, the fruit is so sweet and, um, and every, you're not the only one that likes sweet fruit. A lot of ants like it, a lot of bugs, a lot of critters like it, birds especially. So there's, you, there's a spray that you can put on that will deter a lot of those pests. And you put it on two to four times during the season, depending upon the particular uh, plant that you're growing. And also pruning, you do have to prune these plants. Some of them you basically, for the most part, this is a generalization, but I want you to research before you go cutting stuff up. When you prune, you prune with a clean pair of pruners or loppers or what have you, clean it with alcohol so you don't introduce any disease to your plants. And um, most, I mean, in, in a lot of cases, I should say the majority of cases, what you do is you will prune in late winter because you know the plant is dormant. You don't want to be cutting the plant while it's not, you know, bef before, it's, before, it's, uh, uh, before it goes dormant. You're cutting a live plant. You may disrupt the life cycle of the plant. It may go into, the shock, into shock and die. So be careful about that and do some research on the particular plant that you're growing. We also, here at Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens, we do host a presentation on backyard orchards. I don't know if we have any left this year in our schedule, but you may want to check that out on the website, blackstonevalleyveggiegardens.com, upcoming events. Okay, so let's talk about some other plants that give you a really, really good bang for the buck. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, Jerusalem artichokes. They're not from Jerusalem and they're not artichokes but they're an extremely hearty, wonderful, superfood, source of food right here. They were a main staple of our Native Americans hundreds of years ago that used to live right here in, uh, in our area, the Nipmucks. And Jerusalem artichokes, uh, they also are called sunchokes. There's a flower that shoots up, a little sunflower that shoots up uh, it's not a real pretty sunflower. It's kind of small, like a big daisy, but it's all yellow. They grow between six, excuse me, between eight and 12 feet tall. And under the ground, they develop a tuber, knobby tuber, looks just like ginger, has nothing to do with ginger, doesn't taste like ginger, but it's, an, it's, uh, it's filled with inulin and it actually will regulate a diabetic sugar. And uh, they do give you a little bit of upset stomach if you're not used to them but they will keep bearing and bearing and bearing. Some people call it invasive, an invasive plant. 
and some people will call it a reliable source of food. I'll let you be the, I'll let you decide. Okay. So, the next one is asparagus. Asparagus comes in three colors, green, purple, and white. A good asparagus bed will keep bearing asparagus spears for up to 40 years. You keep it clean. Uh, of course, perennial beds get all, you know, everything blows in there and, and you're, you know, they need, they need to be fed because it's not like you can just do a crop rotation on your perennial beds. So you have to do that. Uh, it takes two to three years before it starts to bear any, any uh, spears. But the good thing about asparagus is that asparagus is an early spring vegetable. So before your cabbage comes in, before your uh, beans come in, even before your peas can, no, no, sorry, that's not right. Probably around the same time as your peas come in, you'll have beautiful asparagus spears. Then we'll talk about your strawberries. Strawberries also a perennial plant. A strawberry, a particular strawberry plant lasts a few years, but what it does when you get the plants get in the bed is they shoot off these runners above the ground. They're like, they're like roots almost, but on the end of that runner, wherever it lands in the dirt, a new strawberry plant will start, will start sprouting up and will take root. So they call those runners. And um, that's how you're, strawberry patch gets to be a strawberry patch through a series of you know runners taking off and 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 uh, creating new plants but after a while those those runners um they die and you know there's debris there and you, you've got to clean it out and, and de-weed and 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 all that whenever you have a, a perennial bed especially strawberries so as i say one straw and then there's plants die you know three to five years uh, one particular strawberry plant will, will be alive and then of course the, the next generation of plant takes over from there. But it does take a few years for your strawberry plant to really grow in and be thick and healthy and, and start bearing on a daily basis. I have some wonderful, and there are a couple of types of strawberries that you might want to think of if you're trying to be sustainable and, and be in it for the, you know, for the season, get as much food, biggest bang for your buck. Um, the big strawberries, I have some that are supposedly as big as a peach, but they're as big as golf balls, and I'm happy with that. I got them from the Gurney Company online. They don't pay me, but um, but they're called Whoppers, and they're and they're lovely. June bearing, they come up in May, and and by the by the time um, July comes rolling around, you know I don't I don't get any more strawberries. They also have ever bearing strawberries that come out around the same time, beginning of June but they keep going throughout the season. They keep going and going and going. Those bear a smaller strawberry, so um, you know they don't grow the big, big, fat, juicy ones. But a lot of people use them and they do fine with them and they you know, pick them and put them in their smoothies or they put them in their pancakes in the morning or you know, make a strawberry salad out of it or short, strawberry shortcake or what have you. But the, the other bearing ones are the smaller ones, the June bearing ones. You get a big bang for your buck all at once in, in June. You have to freeze them or, or can them or do, what, do whatever, you, you know, whatever you do to preserve your, your, your harvest. Also, you have your herbs. And you know your perennial herbs, I have, I have a mint plant that I planted here. I don't know, it's maybe 10 years ago. And I planted it in, um, in the cavity of a, a cement block, like a cinder block. Uh, I planted it in the and in every in every year, it comes up, I, and every every fall so it doesn't get all scraggly. These herbs are you know these I'm talking about herbs, your lemon balm, your oregano, your sage, your mint, your spearmint, uh, thyme. These are all true perennials, meaning that they are perennial at the root. The tops are scraggly; they get you know through the hard harsh New England winter. So I cut mine all the way to the bottom when I put my garden to bed, probably around the end of November. I cut them all the way to the base and put some mulch on there to keep them warm. And in the summer, 
they come up nice and round and full every year to greet me. The other thing about herbs when you're growing and you want a sustainable garden that's that you know that's going to last you all season, make sure to contain these perennial herbs because they can be invasive. And you don't want just a garden full of herbs, that's for sure. You need to get some, you know, tomatoes and peppers and all the rest of the good stuff and you don't want them being crowded out by these nasty herbs that uh, don't know when to stay in their own lanes. So, so let's talk a little bit about uh, preserving your harvest. I'm an established gardener and I, I can actually go out in my garden most days. Um, it used to be that I could do so eight months out of the year, then nine months, then 10. But along with my uh, Jerusalem artichokes and the spinach that I overwinter, I think I can probably, unless it's, you know, 10 degrees below zero out there, and I would never think to go out at that, that time, but I can, I can probably live pretty well um, eating from the garden. However, I can't eat tomatoes because they can't handle a frost. So some stuff you got to put up and, you know, you have to, you certainly have to uh, preserve your, your harvest. Okay. So we do have another presentation. I, sh I show it once in a while. It's a big hit in the fall and it's called uh, canning, freezing, and dehydrating. And um, these are three techniques that are gar the gardener's friend. Um, just one more uh, hint about that, right? Or one, one, another tip. When you grow tomatoes, for example, you don't want to grow, you may not want to grow all, you may love brandy wine, beefsteak tomatoes. But if you know them, you must know them to grow them, you know that it's a very long, takes a long time to develop a tomato that big. So while you're waiting for your brandywine tomatoes to come out in August, you could be eating cherry tomatoes the end of June. So try to grow a variety of different types of food, you know, some that you'll have in the spring and then some, you know, that you'll have, you know, later on in the season. So in any case, but you're still going to have to can, freeze, and dehydrate some things because they don't last. So, uh, you know, they, they won't last uh, in, the, in the garden. The so heads up about the canning piece. Um, of these three, uh, the, the, uh, the canning and the dehydrating are the two that uh, don't need refrigeration. I still remember one time. Uh, we had a, an outage, a, a power outage in Worcester. I was I was working in in South Pro, and a lot of my coworkers lived out in the Worcester area. And the power didn't come on in some cases for two weeks. So in that case, your 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 frozen food is gone unless it happens in the middle of the winter, right? So it is always good to have some canned or dehydrated food on hand in case of an emergency. Any good prepper will tell you that. I have a lot of friends that are prepper. They, I'm not one, but they've taught me a whole lot about home canning and dehydrating, etc. So canning. There is a website out there. The USDA has a website out there specifically for canning. Don't be afraid to can. Uh, don't be afraid of botulism. You just follow the instructions established in, in, uh, by, in that, those USDA guidelines and you can can safely and uh, efficiently by using the mason jars, the, the, the new, new, new style mason jars. They used to have it, you know, with all these, these jars with these rubber rings and wires and all these fancy contraptions. They don't have that anymore. There's a, there's a three piece unit. There's the glass, the glass jar. There's the, uh, the screw top, and then there's the lid. Uh, so, so you can certainly do that. Home canning, the, the, the goods that you can use in your water bath canner or your pressure canner have a shelf life of one to two years. They may not be bad after that time. They may lose flavor, uh, but generally speaking, so if I'm making spaghetti sauce and I'm 
canning my spaghetti sauce, uh, then by the time next year tomatoes come rolling around, I'll be about done with my one year's batch that I have been savoring throughout the, the uh, off season for tomatoes. So freezing. Freezing is a good way. It's quick, you know, it's quick. If you got room in your freezer, the best way to do it though, to make it last five times longer than normal is to use a vacuum sealer. They have, uh, I have a food saver. They have, they used to have seal and meals. Not sure if they still have that, but there are multiple ways in, that you can freeze uh, that are better than just a plastic uh, baggie that you, that some people use. So. Uh, and the, the, to just, you know, to be uh, cognitive of that, of how to freeze, the enemies of, of, uh, free, uh, of frozen food is air. Uh, so you gotta squeeze all that air out of those bags or you'll get ice crystals inside. You don't want that. Also, the next type of uh, uh, food preservation technique is dehydrate. And I have a dehydrator, I have an Excalibur. There are several kinds, they can cost you anywhere from $35 to three, over 300. Mine's kind of a decent one. I do a lot. Uh, dehydrating can last between five to 10 years. Uh, dried fruit tends to last closer to five, while dried veggies can remain edible for up to 10 years. So, and there's another food preservation technique that I don't typically talk about here. And uh, that is the one the real die hard uh, preppers use, and that's the freeze drying. Freeze dry foods, you can buy cans of freeze dried beef stew and all that, you just reconstitute it. That can last, that food can last 25 to 30 years or more. However, uh, the, the commercial, uh, the, the personal use dehydrators, you know, for the home use are, are you know, that can, that can be $2,000 or more. So it's a little bit out of most, most people's price range, unless you have a lot, a lot of food you want to put up. So anyway, that's why I didn't really bake it into the presentation too much. So here, and um, if you want this presentation, please send me an email. I will certainly get you this presentation. Uh, the Home Center for Food, uh, the, excuse me, National Center for Home Food Preservation, USDA Publications, and here is the link here. And as I say, I will certainly uh, give you if, if you, if you give me, send me an email, I will send you this presentation with all the links in, embedded in it, so. So let's talk about lengthening the season. Okay, so I want to tell you what to, in, in, you know, if I didn't say this, I, I meant to. Part of sustainability is, I said, I did, doing more with less. So in, 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 in money's kind of important uh, to the majority of us. So this is a technique that I use that'll help, help you pace yourself through the gardening season. And here's a link over here, www.winterstone.org. Check it out. There's a technique here where what you do in the winter, I'm talking winter, starting December 21st is winter, right? You prepare these milk jugs. Uh, you cut them open, you plant some seeds, you tape them up with duct tape, and you bring them outside. It rains in them and it snows in them and any kind of moisture that goes through the hole because the, the cap is off. Um, you'll, you'll see the uh, evaporation on the sides of the milk jug. You'll, you'll see it has that, uh, 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 the uh, greenhouse effect. And within, within a matter of months, you know, by the spring, you'll actually see uh, these milk jugs act as little greenhouses and you'll see the plants come up and then you'll be able to transplant them in the spring. No special lights for your home. Uh, you know, no greenhouse needed. 
So if you don't mind your, your backyard or your front yard or whatever with a bunch of uh, milk jugs in it, uh, it's a good technique to look into. Very, very low cost. And plus, you're giving all those jugs, milk jugs, a, a second life. So, okay, so lengthening the growing season. Here's a hoop house over here. That hoop house is probably some bendable PVC pipe. And then uh, there's a, there's a, tra there's a uh, plastic sheeting that you can put over the top of that. And you can grow stuff in there all year long, stuff like spinach, sometimes even lettuce, and um, some, some cold hardy greens that, that love that, that, that temperature. There's two types of materials you use on a hoop house. The first kind is that the plastic sheeting. It keeps it 10 to 20 degrees warmer inside that house, inside the, the hoop house, than outside the hoop house. So it really does a good job of making it feel quite warm in there. Uh, it doesn't let any air in and you do have the condensation in the greenhouse effect. The other material you may use is a garden fabric, garden cloth. They call it a row cover. It's porous. You attach it in the same way to the, to the greenhouse, but the rain will permeate it the wind will blow through so there'll be no molding and it'll keep it five to 15 degrees uh, warmer than the, than the ambient uh, temperature around it. So not quite as, it doesn't do have quite the same warming impact as the plastic sheeting. So, but those are the two materials as the plastic sheeting and there's the garden cloth or uh, garden fabric. Second one is, uh, uh, lengthening the growing season you can certainly use a greenhouse to start things earlier and and start your fall crops early and the greenhouse you can make your own you can get some old two, two by fours and some old old windows um, or you can buy the the, the plastic uh, uh, the uh, glazing material the greenhouse panels online and then, of course, there's cold frames, which are little. You can make those yourself with old, old windows as well. There's a lot of uh, patterns for those, uh, blueprints for those out on the, uh, on the web as well. So those three techniques on how to, uh, how to lengthen the growing season. So also, I come across far too many people that grow their gardens in the end of May. Here, here in New England, I'm here in zone six, they're starting their crops at the end, at Memorial Day. I have, I'm eating from my garden in March. So the thing is there are cool weather crops and a lot of times you can get more than one season out of them. Let's talk about those for a bit. There are, there are uh, cool weather crops that you can start uh, indoors or you can start them in your, in, your, uh, in your milk jugs, right? Hardy vegetables, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, collards, onions, and mutabaga. They do not care if there's a frost out there. A lot of times they don't care if there's a freeze out there. And typically, as I say, you may want to start those indoors. They have a long you know, they, they're kind of persnickety when it comes to planting them, starting them from seed outdoors. Um, hardy vegetables, again, but these you can start directly from seed. Kale, kohlrabi, peas, radish, spinach, and turnip. Just throw the seeds in the ground. Early, March, April. There's a guideline out there for whatever your zone is. You just go in and say, uh, vet, uh, uh, zone six veg, uh, ha, uh, vegetable schedule or something. Do, do a Google search and it'll tell you when you can plant these crops. Semi-hardy vegetables. These crops on the, uh, on the right-hand column may not be able to take a full-flown freeze, but a light frost won't phase them in the least bit. Cauliflower, artichokes, and celery, you start those indoors. 
arugula, Asian greens, beets, carrots, endive, lettuce, potatoes, salsify, Swiss chard. You can start those directly from seed, typically twice. There's two cool seasons, right? There's the spring and there's the fall. So be aware of that. Last year I planted uh, in the fall, I don't know if it was September, October, I planted some spinach and I planted some three, four season, I believe, four season uh, lettuce and some carrots. And those carrots were delicious in the spring. The, the uh, spinach made it all the way through and I think it, it ended up bolting to seed probably around maybe May. So I had a full you know, season in the early spring of, of eating the, the best lettuce I ever grew because it always seems to die on me. It just goes to seed, you know, when I, when I plant it in the spring. But in any event, uh, you can certainly plant those in the fall. And, um, you know, it's spring, try it in the spring and in the fall. Cool weather crops. Now, here are, here are some crops that you can succession plant. What I mean by oh yeah, sorry about that. Uh, what I mean by succession plant is these seeds, these vegetables come to fruition long before the season is over. So peas, for example, peas may take you start them in March. They may take sixty days. March, April, May. Well, in May you stick more in there, and then you know. May, June, July, and then the end, end of July, you stick more in there, so you'll get several generations of plants in, in, one, in one season, in one year. Same way with lettuce. lettuce. Lettuce will certainly, you can start it in March. It doesn't mind the cold. You know, it'll do quite, quite well. And then in the summer, it just likes the summer. It certainly grows, but it grows too quickly and goes to seed. So every couple of weeks, you got to plant a couple of uh, lettuce seeds out there to make sure you have a steady supply or you won't be able to have a salad you'll have you know lettuce earlier on in the season and tomatoes later on and cucumbers later on what you want to do is be able to have a nice salad all at once same way with your carrots and your beets 60 days you know to 55 days to fruition you know you have a long season so every couple of weeks plant it Stick a couple of new seeds in the ground. Find room for them. Find out what their companion plants are. You know, what, what plants like to be planted next to them and avail yourself of that, uh, you know, that uh, technology. So let's also talk about uh, money saving. Okay. Here in Massachusetts anyway, I say this. We can get, there are ways you can invest. It, it, there's, you know, there's a decent return on investment in solar panels. Uh, sometimes there's no cost at all. And, and sometimes there is, it depends on the program you're on. But you use it to power your house. You can use it to heat your greenhouse. You can use it to power your irrigation system. And then you send the excess back to the grid and they'll pay you for it. So also, you know, um, right now, as of the day this is being recorded, there is a, uh, it is 116 degrees in Portland, Oregon. It has never been 116 degrees in Dallas, LA, or Miami. So we know, I mean, I am a true believer that, that climate change is real. Here in, in where I am, or where I sit, and record this. In the last hundred years, our, our average temperature has gone up four degrees. That's huge. So uh, we need to be efficient with our water. It's a it's a uh, you know limited resource. So it's not a bad idea to invest in drip irrigation. This is a fancy schmancy one, but you don't have to be fancy about it. Uh, you can get some rain barrels. Some towns around here actually have programs where you can get low cost rain barrels. You can invest in some drip lines, get some timers so that you're, you, can, you can water uh, you know, at the same time. I think that it's best to water in the evening so that your plants take a nice long drink without being disturbed by the sun trying to evaporate all the water that you, you put in there. So 
I would think that it would be a good thing to have a timer. And then, you know, if you have a big garden, you may need to install a water pump in order to make sure that, you know, the whole line gets, you know, uh, benefits from, from, the, from the water. So, and the other thing good about these drip lines is, you know, what they are is they're like hoses with little, little uh, pinholes in them. And then the water comes out and, and, uh, and it waters the, the earth. The foliage will like a nice drink too, but you got to concentrate on the roots, right? Because that's what's absorbing all the all the rainwater, making the plants grow. Sometimes when our plants are huge, you know, our tomatoes get to six, eight feet tall. Uh, the what do you you know? It's really hard to water at the roots because there's so much in the way. So this is a really good way to save time, and you know, to conserve on water is just to make sure that you plant. Uh, excuse me, you water efficiently and you know you automate the whole process. So drip irrigation. You can get drip irrigation kits for 150 bucks at no frills at Home Depot and, and install your own. This this article's out there on I know all us gardeners are all YouTubers, so there's articles out there. A lot a lot of a lot of content. So also uh, you're buying all this soil, you know, from Walmart or you're having it delivered from a landscaping company. You know, you can create your own compost. You create compost anyway. Humans create compost within their daily lives. We don't have a, you know, we have a too big a carbon footprint. But uh, if you collect your grass clippings, your fallen leaves, your coffee grounds, your eggshells, Shredded cardboard, shredded brown paper. I may be forgetting something. Um, throw it all in a, you know, you can get a compost bin or you can get a compost pile. Keep stirring the heck out of it. And make sure everything's small when it goes in there. Make sure your, your as it says in number two, crushed fallen leaves or else they'll have a matting effect. You don't want that. And it will turn to black gold within a matter of six months. And that's what you need. That's the basis for your soil is that, you know, is that lovely compost. And every year you enrich your, your garden beds with the compost before you plant. You need very little in the way of fancy, fancy uh, earthworm casting or bat poop or whatever they're trying to sell you. I mean, it is good to have some good fertilizer, but for the most part, you have to start off with a decent uh, soil. Soil is everything to gardeners. So, and that's how you make your own compost. We also do have a presentation on composting. I think it's the second one I ever did. And um, you can research that, Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens. Um, and that's in upcoming events to see if we have any scheduled. And there's bound to be one on the web. So if you want to do, you know, look, look in YouTube, you may, you may find one as well. Seed saving. Okay, we do have a presentation on life cycle of seeds, which goes into this in, in depth. So every year, except for last year, the University of Rhode Island has this deal with, with uh, job lot, Ocean State job lot, where at the end of the season, they buy all the packs, all the leftover packs of seeds from all the job lots around. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of seeds. However, seeds are good for more than one year, as you, as you probably know. If you have to break it down and have to put your arms around it, you would say they're probably good for three to four years, but that's not an absolute because not every seed goes bad at the same time. So um, in, if you're planting with a seed pack that's getting kind of old, Instead of, you know, planting two to a hole, maybe you'll plant three to a hole and see what happens. If you have too many, you can pull one out. You can snip it off. Or you can gently take it out and, and transplant it. So, so buy those leftover seed packs. The URI had them, you know, uh, last year, of course, with COVID, they didn't have it. But they sell them to the average Joe Schmoes as a form they put out on the internet. 
um, every once in a while. Uh, you have to catch it while it's out there and you can buy the, buy the packs for 25 cents a pack shipping and handling. Some of these seed packs are expensive, especially the ones with fancy herbs and you know seed tapes. Some people like seed tapes. I guess it's hard for some people to see the little tiny carrot seeds. So they use seed tapes in order to space them and they cost like six bucks, but you can get them 25 cents a pack. So anyway, check out URI. Also, uh, just an FYI, uh, Little House of Seeds had seeds this past year for 55 cents, full packs of seeds. Uh, dollar, dollar, dollar seed has seeds for dollar pack. And they may not have all the information about, you know, how many days to fruition and how tall the plant is. So you may have to go on Google and do a tiny bit of research, but, but there's a huge difference in the price. You know, some of these burpee seed packs are two sixty nine versus fifty five cents. I mean, that's you know, that's like twenty twenty percent that you're paying. You know, to go to uh, uh, the uh, little shop of seeds, little shop of seeds, and dollar seed are the are the two ones. Also, every you know, Amazon at the end of the season, you'll see seed bulk seed uh, packages delivered you you just buy it's like 50 cents a package and you can buy a whole bunch a, a set of a variety of different different seeds i don't know if it's 50 cents a package some fairly inexpensive year old seeds but the thing is what you're supposed to be doing you know i still remember getting a pack of seeds one time from burby they were beautiful seeds they were yoga beets and uh, they were in the pretty uh, red and white striped beets. When you cut in the middle of them, it looks like a peppermint candy. But they're a thousand beet seeds. I like beets, but a thousand beet seeds? I mean, that's a bit much, don't you think? So um, what, what we do is we get together and we trade every year, except last year we had a real, real small one. But uh, most years we get together and we have a seed exchange. Why not? Not only do you trade the seeds that you buy because the packs are too big, but you but you, excuse me, you trade the seeds that, that you, um, that you save from your garden, which is the best way to do it. So, and how do you save seeds? You can make sure before you put a seed away, if you're, if you're harvesting seed, before you put it in a package, it's completely dry or you'll have mold. Trust me, you'll have mold. I remember one year I, I, I grew I was in the seed of the month club. So I bought some mustard seed and, and uh, planted mustard greens are just wonderful. The bugs kind of get at them. I was learning and uh, they create little seed pods on top that, and, and I fastidiously by hand opened all those seed pads, seed pods and took out all those uh, hundreds and hundreds of seeds. I think I probably ended up to less than an ounce. I thought I, I thought that I had uh, dried them out enough, but I didn't, and it all molded on me, broke my heart. So make sure that uh, they uh, that you make sure they're dry before you put them in any kind of baggie, any kind of envelope or anything. Um, so also, when you store your seeds, store them in a place that's dry, in a place that's dark. Or they may try to germinate on you, or they may lose, you know, they may not last as long. So in a place, your garage, is a, your basement is a great place. If you have room in your freezer, put them in your freezer. They'll last even longer. Cool and dry is a secret for seed saving. So let's talk about some cash crops, okay? So let's talk about garlic, okay? One, one clove, one bulb of garlic, obviously will give you several cloves of garlic, right? So one clove of garlic, one, excuse me, one bulb of garlic, maybe 16 cloves. Stick 16 cloves of garlic in the soil in, in, in October. And in July, you'll have 16 heads of garlic. So do you need 16 heads of garlic? I mean, I know it lasts you right into the fall if you store them again in a cold and dry place with air 
circulating, um, but you may want to sell some. You buy two heads of garlic, and that's like 30 some odd heads of garlic that you can create from that. And you're doing it in a place where the rest of your garden is, is dormant at that time because you plant them in the fall. So you can make some money, a little bit of money. You know, I'm not saying you, you know, you're going to be a rich uh, millionaire from, from growing garlic in one bed, but it will help you plow that money into something else for your garden, some seeds, some, some uh, you know, some mulch, whatever. Then the herbs, you can do herbs, you can do cuttings with herbs, or you can save the seeds from herbs. Or some herbs just propagate wherever they darn well feel like it, and you gotta break them up. So you can sell those herbs, those extra herbs, quite easily. One lemon balm plant, I, I planted one lemon balm plant, and I've probably gotten uh, 20 lemon balm plants out of it. You know, lemon, unlike its mint cousin, common mint will propagate with its roots under the ground. The lemon balm also propagates with its roots under the ground, but it also drops viable seed. So you'll see lemon balm growing up wherever. I use that. I sell it. I give it away. Uh, but you can certainly uh, make, make money from, from splitting up your, your herbs. People love herbs, fresh herbs. No better way to take a boring old meal and make it taste like a gourmet million, million dollar meal. Also, radishes. You can grow a boatload of radishes and they are three weeks from seed to plate. So in three weeks, you can have, uh, you can keep turning them over, turning them over, turning them over, grow a whole bunch of them, bring them to the farmer's market. So, and also those sunchokes I told you about, Sunchokes, aka Jerusalem artichokes, do not have a long shelf life outside the garden. That's why they don't sell them in the uh, they don't sell them in the grocery stores. They don't last long enough. Uh, so people want them. They want to start being sustainable. They'll buy them from you, and they'll buy them from you for about one or two dollars for each little tuber. And you can you can easily. I think I probably made. I don't know, a few hundred dollars in the last few years from getting rid of my extra, uh, my extra sun chokes, Jerusalem artichokes. So it really is a good cash crop. So and with all these little, little tips and all these ideas, and you know, for me, when I talk about cash crops, a, a crop, uh, I like to be sustained, I don't like to be greedy. I'm not really doing, I, I, I lecture and, and, and I, I work to make money. Uh, However, when I sell crops, basically I do that to get more food and to trade and to, you know, buy more perennials, et cetera. So, so those are the, that's the question and answer period. And um, I think we're up. So if you do have any questions, let me, I do have my email here. Again, my email is bbveggiegardens uh, at gmail.com. Any questions you have about gardening? Please feel free to uh, to drop me a line, and um, and I'll get back to you within a day or two. This is Kate Donovan signing off. Thank you very much, and happy gardening.